Tonight's special guest speaker, Linda Ionello, is an underwater photographer and author based out of Southeast Florida where scuba diving opportunities abound. Linda has been scuba diving and taking underwater photos for more than 30 years with a special interest in using macro photography to capture the most minute details on tiny marine creatures. Recently, her focus has shifted to blackwater photography. In just the last eight years, Linda has done more than 450 blackwater dives. Tonight, Linda will be giving us an in-depth glimpse, pun intended, into the world of blackwater diving and the breathtaking marine creatures that she's photographed here in Florida under the cover of darkness. I'm so excited to welcome to the stage Linda Ionello. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, as Zach said, I'm going to talk to you about blackwater diving and the creatures that we find on those dives. And probably most of you have never heard of a blackwater dive before. So what is it? Well, black means it's a night dive. So we're going out in the ocean at night looking for all these little creatures. Next, it's done in deep water. So there's no reef reference. So we are in the water column. I just want to set. Yeah. OK, we're in the water column. And the, the bottom where we're diving is anywhere from like 700, 750 feet. And we're diving in the top 40 or 50 feet. We are definitely not going anywhere near the bottom. It's a drift dive here in South Florida. We're impacted by the Gulf Stream. And we're further offshore, so we're definitely drifting from south to north on these dives. But we really don't notice it because everything is drifting. The, the buoy that we follow, the critters that we're chasing, hopefully we're all drifting at the same speed. And finally, think small. These subjects that you're going to see tonight, most of them are about an inch or smaller. So all of these creatures are very tiny. So, what is the science behind this? It's the largest animal migration on Earth. It takes place every night in the oceans, and it's called Dial vertical migration. These small creatures come up from the deep at night for access to food. And the reason they do it at night is because the predators that use eyesight for hunting can't see them. A lot of these are larvae. They're babies of things that will eventually settle on the reef or on the bottom, but others are holopelagic, which means they live their whole lives in the water column. So they go from babies to mating, spawning, etc. Every dive is different. You can't go out, like if you're looking at things on the reef, or especially muck diving, you find something one day, you can go back and find it again the next day. Not these dives. Every dive is unpredictable, and you just really have to take what it gives you. So why do we do it? Well, for me, it was a whole new world. I dove the reefs and the muck dives and everything for years, and everything on those dives is pretty predictable. It's known to science, and I got a little interested in something new and different. So in this case, everything was new and different. And a lot of them were new to science. So we had to learn. The big thing is IDing these subjects and learning about their behavior. And that's my focus. I am a hunter. I figured out years ago, I'm not taking pictures to win contests, etc. I'm taking pictures for the science and learning about the creature. And bottom line on these ones at first was identifying them. And as Zach said, I've done over 450 of these dives locally in the last eight years. And I've also done these kinds of dives in the Pacific, Indonesia and Analau mainly. But everything in this presentation is local. All these subjects are found locally. So what is the reason, the importance of these subjects? Every, all of the we, we're exhausting the resources in the shallow ocean. So companies are looking to trawl deeper. And also, we're running into deep sea mining. We, there are certain ores that can be found on the bottom. 
but both of these activities destroy the, these animals that live in the water column and live on the bottom. So I'm trying to increase awareness of these subjects and what we know more about, we'll learn to protect, hopefully. So, the mechanics of the dives. There's two dive boats locally that do these dives, Pure Vita divers and Walker's dive charters. They both go out of the same area, out of Palm Beach Inlet. They will head south about five or six miles. The captain tries to determine the strength of the current so that after we go in the water and drift back north again with the current, we'll end out right outside the inlet. Doesn't always work that way, but they, that's the plan. So we'll go about five or six miles south and about five or six miles offshore until we're around 700 feet deep. And then the boat puts divers in the water. And as I said, we all drift north, hopefully to the inlet. So the mechanics of the dive is that the boat puts in this buoy with a line with lights down it and then a light at the bottom at about 45 feet. So the divers drift with this buoy and it's the divers responsibility to stay close to the buoy within sight of it and for photographers the buoy becomes your dive buddy which for photographers is excellent because we're not good dive buddies. We don't want to stay with anybody. We find a creature, we want to take its picture as long as we can. So this is ideal for photography. And we found that you should stay above about 45 feet, unless you really, really know what you're doing. But the current under 45 feet can be different than near the surface. So if the current is weaker, which seems to be the case, you'll end up chasing the ball. If you're not careful, things will get away from you. So ideally, you stay above about 45 feet, which is the bottom light on the line. So it's kind of easy to manage. And you need good buoyancy and depth awareness. Again, you've got to be reasonably comfortable in this environment with no reef line. And you also have to be careful because a lot of these creatures that you're photographing are going to go shallow or deeper and you can't follow them down to 100 feet. And so you want to be really aware of your depth. And a lot of people like me, their ears will start to tell you if you're going deeper, your ears start to hurt and say, OK, back up. So this is what it kind of looks like when we're entering the water from the back of the boat. You can see the buoy. You can see the lights. It's very visible to the boat. So it's very safe. You know, the boat is following the buoy. The divers are following the buoy. And it's really well, well prepared, well thought out. So let's talk about some of the creatures. I'm going to start with fishes, because those are the first things that we saw that, OK, that kind of made sense to a degree. Now, this was one of the iconic larvae that we saw. It's a spot fin flounder larva. Well, flounders are bottom dwellers, flat, but they don't have all these appendages. And this is a clear example of how the larvae look so different than the adults and why the identification was so difficult. Because the, the adults don't look anything like this with all these things coming off of them. And the other thing about flounders is they're bottom flatfish. So the eyes are on the top of the head. Both eyes are on the top of the head. They lie on the bottom, and they're ambush predators. So if we go back to the larva, He's got one eye on one side and the other eye is on the other side. So before he settles, that other eye is going to migrate around to the top, what will be the top when he settles on the bottom. So there's all this interesting science in these subjects. So this is a different flounder, a different species. This is an eye. Now you can see both eyes are on top. So he's about ready to settle. He'll settle on the bottom, and the eyes are in the right place. And this is what an eyed flounder looks like on the bottom. And again, you can see the eyes are on top. Now, the image on the right is an example of what happens when we come along with our lights and our cameras and everything. These creatures don't want to be in the light. They came up in the dark. And they start spinning. This guy is spinning around. Or they head for the surface, or they head for the bottom. 
So it is not easy photography. So okay, we figured out flounders. Well, this looks like another flounder. He's got these appendages and he's a flat fish and everything. But it turns out this is a tongue fish. So again, learning curve. So the tongue fish is another flat fish that will spend its time on the bottom. But the tongue fish are unique because they have this protruding gut. This thing on the bottom is their gut. And eventually, when they're ready to settle, it will either be absorbed, I think it gets absorbed, but it definitely disappears. So this is what a tongue fish looks like on the bottom. Again, eyes on top of the head, another flat fish. These, <laughs> one of the divers in our group nicknamed these tutu fish. They hang in the water column with their fins extended. And the one on the left is an invasive lionfish that you've probably all heard about. And it's really pretty as a larva. And then the one on the right is a soapfish larva. And like I said, they'll hang in the water column with their fins extended until we come along with the lights. And then they pull in their fins and head for the bottom. So again, challenging photography. This is a tripod fish, which is a larva of a deep water fish. And again, hanging with fins extended until we interrupt it. And the tripod fish adults are deep water fish. And this is why it's called a tripod fish. It hangs on the bottom with the tail and the two fins and just waits for the current to bring food to it. <laughs> Lazy. <laughs> But the scientists started seeing these images that we were in situ images. And normally, they, they see creatures that are hauled in a net. And they never see them in the water column. And they saw them sitting there with their fins extended and said, this is mimicry. They're mimicking jellyfish. Well, jellyfish don't taste good. A lot of them sting. And also, they're not very nutritious. So the fish, these little babies, are mimicking jellyfish as a survival tactic. These are cute. These are deep water angler fish, and we call them fish in a bubble. The larvae have this bubble around them. And again, it has to be a protective mechanism until they get bigger. So these are two deep water ones. So the adults will live down at the bottom in the deep. The angler fish are interesting. The female is much larger than the male and does the feeding and hunting and everything. And the male basically becomes a parasite. It, it, it's tiny, it attaches itself to her, feeds off of her system, but he's a sperm donor. So that's the whole purpose of the male. So, <laughs> the interesting thing about this one is the scientist said, that's a female. I said, well, how do you know that's a female? It has that lure starting. And anglerfish have this lure that they put out in front of them to attract prey. Well, in this environment, only the female needs one of those because the male doesn't hunt. So he said, this is a female. She's developing a lure. And this is what the adult of this species looks like. That's a heck of a lure. But that's what it is, sticking out there. And she wags it around and curious creatures come close enough that she can feed on them. Now this looks like the anglerfish. It's a frogfish, but this is a frogfish that will end out on the reef or shallow. And the reason we know that is he has that little pelvic fin at the bottom. And the frogfish, crawl, a lot of them crawl along on the bottom, so they have this fin. And this is what the adult looks like. And this is from Blue Heron Bridge, if you're familiar with that. And you can see that little foot, and he settles and walks around on the foot. Cusk eels are really interesting. There's about 240 species of cusk eels. And the larvae look nothing like the adults or like each other. So cusk eels have been a real challenge to try to figure out what they're going to grow up to be. So here's just a few of the varieties of what the larvae look like. And you can see how different they are. Now, this is what the adult looks like. Again, just an ugly, plain fish. <laughs> <laughs> and the larvae are so pretty. 
Now, here is one of the bucket list larvae. When we, we don't see this one very often. When we first did, it was like, wow. It has all these appendages. Well, everything that the, they're dragging these appendages around, that takes energy. There has to be a reason, a purpose to make it worthwhile. Well, again, the scientists looked at this guy all strung out and said, this is mimicry again. He's mimicking a siphonophore. Well, siphonophores really sting. If we, we run into them, you feel the sting. So again, it's helping it to survive in this environment. <laughs> this is, I had to throw this, this is a cuscale, <laughs> bony-eared assfish, which everybody loves that common name. And this, this fish has the smallest ratio of brain to size. So I say, well, it, it chose beauty before, before brains for the larvae, but for the adult, not so much. Again, another very plain deep water fish that we would never see the adults, but the larvae are just great photographic subjects. So jacks, we'll go to a common fish. We see quite a few jacks and they like to hide in things or get protection from things. Like the one in the upper left is in the sargasm, very near the surface. The one on the upper right is in the jellyfish tentacles. Now he's safe. That jellyfish is not, is not trapped him or eating him or anything. If anything, he propels the jellyfish around, but he uses those tentacles for protection. And then the one on the bottom is underneath a tube anemone larva, which is not really a heck of a lot of protection for any reason, but he's hiding. <laughs> so gelatinous zooplankton. Changing the subject, these are jellyfish, salps, siphonophores, and the message here is think small. The, the bells are about the size of your thumbnail, and they're very pretty. You know, you've probably seen pictures of moon jellies and big jellies that are plate size and, and they don't have a lot of color. Well, these ones are much, much smaller and have some gorgeous colors and shapes to them. And like the one on the right that is just gorgeous pink. And these ones, the yellow ones, the one on the right is so cute, he sits in the water column and bounces. Most jellyfish kind of move along. He just sits and bounces. And it's really funny to watch. This is a thimble jellyfish, which is seasonal. We see them some um, spring, I think. And the, the larvae of these are believed to be the sea lice, the, the bather's itch that people get. And they believe that's the larvae of these guys. Well, here again, here's a jack hiding in the jelly. And he will, he will definitely control the jelly and move it along where he wants to go. Salps planktonic tunicates. Salps have a tremendous life cycle, which I'm not going to get into, but we see them in different, like the ones in the top are a cluster. The one in the bottom is a single one. Again, it has a jack riding in it, hiding in it. And the ones on the left is a chain. All those orange pieces are organs of the individuals. So remember that image, because I'm going to refer to that later on. Siphonophores, I mentioned, the mimicry. Siphonophores are just gorgeous. They hang out in the water column with all the tentacles extended, shine your light, they close up like this. But eventually, it doesn't take too long, they'll open back up again. And they're just so delicate and so pretty to look at. On my soapbox for a minute, carbon cycling. A quarter of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is absorbed by the ocean. So where does it go? The tiny, tiny photoplankton on the surface absorb it through photosynthesis. Bigger things, zooplankton, come along and feed on that. And then bigger things, the fish, salps, and siphonophores feed on them. So when siphonophores and salps, etc., die, they sink relatively fast to the bottom. They're he relatively heavy. And they take that carbon to the bottom with them and it can stay there for hundreds of years and not impact the rest of the life in the ocean. So these creatures, they, they play a part, they're important. And if we get rid of them, it's gonna impact 
our whole lives. So again, education and learning about these guys. Crustaceans. I don't know if you, how many of you are divers and do a reef dive at night. You get worms in your lights. You just get swarms of worms. Well, in these dives, we get swarms of amphipods. They're little tiny things, smaller than your little fingernail, and they're in the water column, and they're attracted to the lights. Well, they bump into everything, including your subject. So the amphipod bumps into what you're trying to photograph. They both go flying off, and you're frustrated. <laughs> So and we also learn to wear a hood. Otherwise, you come up on the boat with a whole bunch of these in your hair. Andrea, <laughs> one of our divers, knows that. So we pretty much wear a hood. And people also worry about them getting in their ears. But that doesn't seem to be such a risk. But you'll definitely get them in your hair. But they can be beautiful. If you can make them stop long enough to get a picture, they have pretty colors and they have these huge eyes. That's one of the things about these amphipods is their eyes. So again, if you can get them to stop, get a picture. Now this is a specialized amphipod, pelagic amphipod. It's called a monster in a barrel because this female hollows out the salps and lays her eggs, raises and feeds the young inside this salp. So here's a salp with no center, and the female is in the center and all the babies are around the circle. Very, very well organized. The, every time you see these, the babies are around the circle. They're never random all over the place. So she will feed, she propels the salp along and feeds the babies until they're big enough and they just go off on their own. We see these quite often. These are fairly common. Crabs. This is the first stage of crab larvae, zoe larvae, and they all have these projections, top and bottom. And again, there's a reason, evolution reason for these, and that the theory is that it's because it makes them harder to eat. You know, they got these sticks spine. And again, one of our divers nicknamed these stickheads. <laughs> now, crabs, zoe larvae, there aren't any scientists that we're aware of that are working on IDing these. So we have no clue what these babies are going to grow up to be. The next stage is megalopa larvae. And these guys are kind of funny. They've lost their projections. And they swim around in the water column with the legs extended and all spread out. And you come along with your light, and they get all balled up like the one on the bottom. Pull their legs in and just you want to take a picture of me? Fine, but I'm not very pretty now. So, the, and again, we don't know what these are going to be. Spiny lobster larvae, and we do see these a fair amount. Um, they have a habit of hanging on to siphonophores. This one has four going in a circle there. You can see in, his legs are hanging on to siphonophores. And the theory again is siphonophores sting, their protection but they also may be feeding on these siphonophores. On the other hand, slipper lobsters seem to pick one jelly-type thing and just ride on it. They don't use the siphonophores the same way. And how do you tell the difference between a spiny and a slipper? Well, the spiny on the left, the tentacles are straight. And the slipper on the right, the tentacles are flat and forked. And the interesting thing is, when I was posting these, a scientist in Japan was the one who told me how to identify them. So shrimp. Again, we have the same issue that we have with crabs. We don't know what they're going to grow up to be, or even there's some shrimp that live in the water column. So these could be pelagic, or they could be babies. No scientist to help us on this one either. I, this one is just an example of an unusual shrimp. He has, I call those crinoid legs, because the legs look like a crinoid, which is a bottom feathery kind of animal. And here's just a picture of a shrimp, pretty colors, pretty legs and everything. This one is more interesting. This is a deep water shrimp larva. And for years, the scientists were finding them in the stomachs of deep water fish and they thought they were their own species. Well, only about 10 years ago, they figured out that these are not 
a separate species, these are larvae of a deep water shrimp. But again, they come up at night to feed. And I, they make great photo subjects because they're so nice and bumpy and colorful and they have uh, those spines and everything. Mollusks, my favorites. Um, sea butterflies, they're holopelagic, which means they live their lives in the water column. So they, they, they spawn there, they mate there, and live and die in the water column. There's different species, and we see quite a variety sometimes of the year. So these are two different species, but they all have that shell, that shell in the center part that protects their, the animal part, their organs and everything. And they all have some form of wings on top, which is why they're called a butterfly. Now these evolved from mollusks that live and crawl on the bottom. So they evolved to live in the water column instead. And this one is interesting, this species, this is the same animal species, but apparently the one on the right is younger, and as they age, that bottom part gets worn off and gets broken, and, and it looks truncated. And you can see, again, they have a form of wings on top. This is uh, one of my favorites. This, this guy, the next image, is really interesting. But again, it has the wings on the top and it has the shell. But a few of them, when you can find them, have these appendages that look just like leaves. And you step back and, you know, I've been talking about evolution. Everything has a reason. Why would one of these animals that evolved from living on the bottom, probably never saw leaves, why, why did it choose this as some kind of defense? And, you know, we don't know. Nobody can answer that question. But they're stunning when you find them. For feeding, they put out a mucus web, this, all those fine little dots, and trap tiny, tiny food particles. Now, this particular one is interesting because it's trapped a sea star larvae. So you can imagine that sea butterfly, again, is probably the shell, thumbnail size. So the sea star larvae is tiny, but it's still too big for it to eat. Eventually, when it gets enough stuff in the, uh, the web, the mucus web, it will let it go. It will eat what it wants and, and let the rest go. Mating, again, they live their lives in the water column. So we can catch them mating sometimes. And the funny thing about these guys when they're mating is they're usually spinning in a circle and heading for the bottom. So when I see something small spinning in a circle, I go and investigate. And if you shine your lights on them too long, they'll separate. So photo op for a little while. I mentioned spawning. Again, living in the water column. So the one on, these are two different species. The one on the left, the eggs are kind of like a string of pearls. And the one on the right, the eggs are more zigzag like a raft. And they will lay those eggs, spawn them, and then just swim away and leave them. No uh, protection at all. So sea butterflies are at the bottom of the food chain. A lot of things feed on them. This is an Atlantid, which is called a sea elephant, preying on a sea butterfly. So it's that sea butterfly where I mentioned the bottom part gets broken off. So the, he's sucking the animal out of the sea butterfly. So speaking of Atlantis, this is a species of Atlantis that we occasionally see. And again, it's just stunning. It's that gorgeous pink in the water. You see it, you know it. But the other interesting thing is these guys have these gorgeous eyes, big eyes. Now, if any of these animals have eyes, we had to figure out, okay, where are the eyes? And that's what you want to focus on. If you're taking a picture, you want the eyes to be in focus. So these guys at least have these nice big black eyes, but they're small. These are smaller than a lot of the other Atlantis. Oops. So back on my soapbox. Sea butterflies, I mentioned, are a major part of the food chain. Whales, actually, they're quite dense at times in the North Oceans. Whales will migrate to feed on them. But they're becoming ocean canaries. 
because their shells are becoming much more fragile, they're becoming very thin because of the ocean acidification. And the ocean acidification is caused by the elevated CO2. So if these guys can't adapt and evolve to deal with these thin shells that, with less protection, the food chain is going to suffer. Sea angels, a little different than sea butterflies, their shells are lost within a few days of hatching. So they start out with a little tiny shell, but it doesn't last. So they swim around very fast. They're always zipping around, very hard to photograph. They have those little wings, again, why they're called sea angels, and they flap them like mad. And their favorite food is sea butterflies. So they're not much bigger, you'll see. So sea angels, this is the most common one that we find. And again, this, this is like an inch, maybe just a little bit more. And again, swimming very fast in the water columns, so hard, hard to take a picture of. Again, they live in the water column. This is two mating. You can see in the center part where they're intertwined, they're mating. Spawning is when the only time they sit still. They will put out this big mass of eggs and take two to three hours to produce them. And while they're doing that, they just kind of hang in the water column, slowly beating their wings, and great photo ops. And then again, like the sea butterflies, they will swim off and leave the eggs just to hatch in the water column eventually. I mentioned sea butterflies pray for sea angels. So this is a sea angel praying on a sea butterfly, and it's not much bigger. But what it's trying to do is suck the animal out of the shell. Villagers, gastropod larvae. Gastropods are these mollusks that crawl on the bottom, like that image. So these are the babies. Some of the gastropods lay their eggs on the bottom, they, they hatch on the bottom, and that's it. These ones hatch in the water column. Um, the length of time they spend in the water column varies by species, and again, we have no IDs. There isn't anybody working on these to tell us what these larvae are going to grow up to be. We only have IDs for like a couple. So they're gorgeous. They, again, they hang in the water column. They have these lobes spread out. And these lobes have little tiny hairs, little cilia. So those are used for collecting food. They collect the little tiny pieces of food. And they have really pretty colors. They reflect the, the lights. And we get blues and purples and stuff. Now again, they have eyes. So you want to focus on the eyes. Now, this animal is maybe just a little bit bigger than your pinky fingernail. And I swear, they know that we're trying to get their eyes, and they turn their backs. <laughs> and it's so small, it's really hard when you're looking at it to tell if you're shooting the front or the back. So you take a bunch of pictures. But they do. They spin around a lot. And these are just different ones. This is a different variation, obviously a different species. But you can see those little hairs on the lobes, the cilia, that are used for feeding. And those lobes are also used for um, hanging in the water column, for buoyancy. This is, again, obviously a different species. It has these, these bigger lobes that have a, a webbing and different colors. And the, the one on the left is just gorgeous. It's like a uh, wedding veil or something. And this one I nicknamed Sparkles. So this one has the, the two lobes with the webbing, but has this gorgeous reflected colors. And this is one of the really smaller ones. And we don't see him. I think he's seasonal. I was trying to track him. We don't see him that often. And he's usually up fairly shallow, but very hard to find but very pretty. So these guys don't like the lights like everything else, but they will pull in those lobes and pull in the foot. They have a foot like the adults and close themselves up and sink. So again, if you shine your lights on them for too long, they sink and they have an operculum like the, the adult mollusks have this operculum. They call it like a, a door, a trap door to close, shut themselves off. Even the babies do. Now, I've never been able to tra track one long enough and find out how long it takes to open back up again, because they start heading for the bottom. So I just let them go. 
I always liked nudibranchs. The people from Blue Heron Bridge would know. We were always looking for the colorful, different nudibranchs. Well, I was fascinated to find out that there's a pelagic nudibranch. This guy lives his whole life in the water column. So again, you can see the one on the right is spawning. That's, that's a string of eggs coming out of it. And they're very, quite colorful, very pretty, moving fast most of the time, again, zipping around. This is the other species. There's two species of pelagic nudibranchs. This one feeds off of siphonophores. So it will feed on the tentacles that are hanging, work its way up and just de devour the whole siphonophore, and then go look for another one. So the one on the right is free swimming. He's looking for a, a source of food. Squids, they are, <laughs> in some places, Cosmo especially apparently, they see a whole ton of adult squids attracted to the lights. We hardly ever see adults. So we see the little babies. And I swear the little one on the bottom with his tentacles over his head is like, go away, take your lights, leave me alone. <laughs> so these are just baby squids, probably reef squids. Now this one is a different squid. This is deep water. This is a larva, a baby of a deep water squid. So we would never see the adults. But these guys are very photogenic if you get them to kind of hang in this pose with the tentacles all strung out and everything. This is very photogenic. This is the diamond squid larva, another deep water squid, and it has that gorgeous red webbing on the tentacles. And as it gets a little bit older, it just gets stunning colors and, and everything. And then again, when it becomes an adult, it will be down deeper and we would never see it. Octopuses, we see little baby octopuses sometimes. Um, seems to be seasonal. This one in particular, we got an ID, so it's a, it's a, brown, it's a baby brown stripe octopus, and the, the image on the bottom is from Blue Heron Bridge. So he's definitely a local octopus that we see in the shallows. This is a bucket list subject, the blanket octopus. They're around, but apparently not in the area that, we, that we're diving. But the adults, this is a female, she has that gorgeous webbing in between her tentacles. And they could get to be like three or four feet. So if they're around, we would certainly see them, but we're not seeing them. But we do see the babies. So the one on the right is a female. The one on the left is a male. Uh, and the reason we know that one's a male is because it has that pocket where the arrow is pointing. And the males have a specific tentacle that they use for mating, that they pass the eggs, the sperm, to the female. And it's stored in that pouch. So again, we could say that's a male. And the other one doesn't have the pouch, it's a female. So we do see the, the babies, but we don't see the adults, which is a shame because we would love to. Now this is a, this is a real baby blanket octopus, like the fish in the bubble. This little baby has a bubble, and this is the only time I've ever seen this. And it, it has just hatched. Another bucket list subject is the paper nautilus. Now these, these are females. The female builds a shell and that's what she keeps, protects her eggs in. So we know for sure when we see the shell, it's a female. And the image on the left, the female has a specified, a specific tentacle that is flattened. And it, she, she puts it over the shell to protect it, I guess. So that's a female paper nautilus, and, and those, they book for the bottom. Now I told you the salps, the chain of salps with the orange organs. Well, if we see a fairly large salp and all those little orange organs, we look for an extra one because the little baby octopus of these argonauts ride on those salps probably hiding on those salps, and they blend in with the organs. So the one in the middle is a little baby. We don't know when they're this size, we don't know what species it is. But the one in the upper corner, again, we know that's a female 
paper nautilus because it's building a shell. You can see on the top of her head, she's building that shell and it's covered by that, that tentacle, that coloring of the tentacle. So that particular one we know, but most of the ones that are riding in the salps, they're so small and we don't know the species. So I mentioned this is very challenging photography. Um, there's a lot of particulate usually in the water column and that creates backscatter in your images. The, most of the larvae are transparent, like all, all those jellyfish and the flounders and a lot of them are transparent so they take a lot of light. So you've got a lot of strobe power on your camera. And then along comes a reflective fish, like a little jack or something and it's just gonna bounce all that light right back at you and overexpose. So I usually ignore the reflective fish because they're, they're usually fairly common, not as interesting. Then the subjects are so small that we're cropping these images tremendously. So here's a, here's a kind of a worst case scenario. It's a species of sea butterfly. You can see how small it is in the frame and it's full of backscatter. So you have to try to aim your strobes to minimize the backscatter and you want to get that subject in the best focus possible because you're going to be cropping it so much. And this is why we don't enter these images in very many contests. Most contests limit how much you can crop the image. So a lot of these really tiny things, it's impossible. So my camera, it's a Nikon D500. And the reason I use that particular camera is that that camera and lens are one of the fastest focusing. And I, keep, I mentioned these, these animals are constantly moving, spinning. They're, they're not going to sit there and let you take a picture. So the faster the focus, the better. And lots of light. I use three strobes. So I have two on the side and one in the center mounted on top of the housing. So I can use high f-stop. If you're a photographer, I use high f-stops to give me as much detail as possible. I want as much as possible in focus. And again, I aim the strobes for minimal backscatter. Two focus lights. Different people do different things. We, you need lights for hunting to find your subject, and then you need lights for the camera to focus on the subject. So I use two mounted on top of the housing and use them for both purposes. Other people have multiple lights, different ones for hunting in a distance and you know, different combinations, but this is what works for, for the way I operate. 60 millimeter lens. Again, Nikon especially has two macro lenses, a 50 or 60 and a 105, and the 105 seeks. There's too much distance between the lens and the subject and it seeks and it tries to focus on all the stuff in between. So for Nikons, a 60 millimeter lens is the best option. Uh, Canon users, it's a little different. They don't have a really good macro lens in that range. So a, a lot of them are kind of struggling to figure out what lens to use. And finally, a lanyard. I put the lanyard around my wrist because if you drop your camera, you're not going to be able to go get it. And nobody on the deck, on the crew, is going to go get it either. So, you know, if you're on a reef and you drop your camera, well, chances are somebody will go get it. Not in this environment. So some people clip the camera to their BCs or whatever. I use a lanyard. Okay, I'm going to digress a bit. Citizen science, you've probably heard the term in this environment. Um, kind of like general public helping scientists. So, we started a Facebook group, actually, uh, sorry, um, Mike Bardick in Analau, Philippines, started this Facebook group, and we started posting images. And the scientists started looking, we were posting images from all over the world, and I keep saying these in situ images, so they can see what the animal looks like in its environment. And this is how we started getting scientists interested and giving us a lot of IDs. So they provide the IDs, we provide the images versus trawling. Before we started photographing and diving in this environment, the scientists got all their subjects by trawling a really fine net behind the boat. And so by the time the subjects come up on the boat, all those appendages are gone or mangled and they don't know what the animal looked like in its environment. 
So this is how all of this is evolving with this mimicry and learning about these animals. And I also provide images to any scientist for uh, scientific papers. If they're working on a paper and any of my images are educational, etc., provide them. So collecting. Collecting is kind of a, a, an iffy subject. In the past, I would not collect. I was diving on the reef and I was diving at Blue Heron Bridge and all of those subjects are known to science. They know the scientific name and all about them. So I didn't figure it was beneficial and necessary to collect. But now I consider in this environment giving back. These, these subjects are not known to science. And as I mentioned, we need to learn about them and, and study them and protect them. So now it's like giving back to the scientists and try to help them to identify them, this, the, the larvae, and what they're going to be. So uh, we try to focus on subjects that the scientists are actively studying. Like I said, nobody's studying villagers, nobody's studying shrimps, nobody's studying crabs. So we're trying to, if, if a scientist comes to us and says, will you collect something in this area? Great, happy to. So we're collecting with the proper, proper chemicals and data. The, for DNA, which is how they're doing a lot of their IDs now, they, the subject has to be in alcohol. And a lot of the prior collections are sitting in ethanol. And so they can't use them for DNA. So even if they have some of these subjects from years ago, the, they can't pull the DNA. So we're, we're making sure we use the proper chemicals and collecting the proper information on where it was collected, roughly how deep we were, and the date, and all that kind of stuff. And then we provide the accompanying images, which is a big, big thing for the scientists, is that we're not just giving them a dead animal. We're giving them the images of the live animal. And we have the permits. Smithsonian has pulled permits for us to, to enable us so that, again, we're 100% legal. And it's not easy. <laughs> because we're holding our big cameras. We have your camera. But I need those lights to see what I'm trying to collect. And so you take pictures. And half the time, you lose the subject. Either amphipods come along, or it, it goes deep, and you lose track of it. You lose it in the, in the particulate. So, if you get enough images, now you're trying to get this thing in a bag. So you have this little Ziploc bag, and you're trying to collect it with your camera. So it, it's, I'm lucky if I get three or four subjects a dive. And that's assuming that there's interesting subjects that I want. So, so most of our stuff is going to Florida Museum of Natural History. Um, the hydromedusae, the jellyfish, they were really interested in the villagers. We're, we're feeding them villagers, hoping that someone will, will work on them. Uh, worms, coral larvae, that kind of stuff. So there's a um, Gustav Pauli at the Florida Museum is very interested in what we collect. And apparently, they're also really good at sharing. So if we give it to them and someone elsewhere is interested in it, they're good at sharing. So what happened was we had one of our divers, uh, Rich Collins, has been collecting hydromedusae for several years. It went to the Florida Museum, it went to the museum in Switzerland. And one of the scientists there spent a couple years studying all of this, and they came out with a paper in 2021. And they identified 46 species in our area, six additional to genus level, and six new species. So the collecting really paid off. It showed what's here, and it showed new things that they, like this one on the right, is a new species that they identified, that they named. So it's been beneficial. Smithsonian Museum, Smithsonian Institution, at this point, they're interested in the Cuskills. I mentioned there's 240 species, and the larvae look nothing like the adults or like each other. So at this point, they want all the Cuskills that we can find, and they're trying to do DNA to associate them with the adult. Well, cuskills are a deep water fish. So if they don't have DNA on an adult, we're out of luck. But we're contributing what we can. 
And the Smithsonian wrote a paper in 2021 talking about blackwater diving, an exciting window into the planktonic arena and its a potential to enhance the quality of larval fish collections. So they, the fish people at the Smithsonian, again, woke up, paid attention to what we're doing, giving us IDs as much as possible. We're turning in the, the samples, they're running the DNA and f telling us what they turn out to be. So it's a great partnership. So what do I do with all this? Uh, a friend and, and I, after a couple of years, said, we're out on the boats, all these new divers are coming up and saying, I saw all kinds of stuff, but I don't know what any of it was. So we put together this book and um, we're on our second edition and it talks about all of these creatures I've been talking about with their IDs and with the information. Again, educating people, protect this environment. So it's available on blackwatercreatures.com or at Pure Vita Divers at their dive shop in Riviera Beach. They have a stock. And this QR code, if anyone wants to take a picture of that, and, and it leads to the Blackwater Creatures website. And then my website, both the, my co-author and I both have websites. Hers is uh, Mir's Photo, mine's Linda Eye Photography. There's a whole bunch, everything that I photographed pretty much, there's one of on, on my website. And in the galleries, there's Blackwater, there's uh, four or five Blackwater galleries. And all the IDs, everything that I've gotten IDs on is there. So if you want to go and look at a whole bunch more subjects and images, and there's no information. You'll have to go Google once, once you find out what it is. So I, I leave this because this is, again, a learning curve. I told you I was very interested in nudibranchs, and I saw this and I thought, oh my god, that poor nudibranch, he's trapped by a jellyfish and he's going to get eaten. And I took the picture, and then I went and did some more research and found out, nope, the nudibranch's eating the jellyfish tentacles. <laughs> <laughs> so just goes to show the learning curve that we're going through, and don't take anything at face value. So that's it. I, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. Questions. What came first for you, diving or photography? Oh, God, uh, diving. And, and would you mind I'm, repeating I'm the question for land. our audience at home? I'm sorry? Would you mind repeating the question for our audience members uh, at home? You're right, I'm sorry. Um, she asked what came first, diving or photography. I was never a land photographer. I'm still not a land photographer. My friends do birding, but diving came first and very quickly photography. Yes? You mentioned seasonality. What differences do you see over the course of the year? Can you generalize that? It's seasonality. It's, we're still learning, and it's still really hard to pin it down. There's a few things that we can say we see in the spring. We see a lot more deep water fish larvae maybe in the spring. Um, other things fall, but, you know, eight years, and I still can't, I still can't, come up with much seasonality. Anything? Ah, uh, yes. How often do you do the dives? <laughs> Weather is a big factor. Um, would, you, would you remind me? I'm sorry, but yes. Okay. <laughs> How often do I dive? In the summer, when it's nice and flat and calm and we can go out a lot, I'll go two or three nights a week. In the winter, it's um, a lot windier, the ocean's a lot rougher, and we can't, because we're five miles offshore, so we can't get out as often, and it's once a month sometimes. So it varies, that's definitely seasonal. But if I can, I'll, I'll get out two or three times a week. You gonna be a diver? <laughs> Good. Anybody? Over here. Have you ever been approached, like from the medical field? We've seen this, 
We don't know what it is, but we're interested in maybe we could do something medically with it. Mm. Have we ever been approached from the medical field? No, not at all. Um, no, I have to say no, just not at all. Um, the scientists that are interested are strictly in the animal itself and, and in the IDs and, and learning about it. But no, nothing medically. And there's another couple over here. Yeah, um, have you or anybody you dive with have, have uh, you had a creature named after you? <laughs> <laughs> um, have, we ha have any of us had a creature named after us? Um, not yet. Uh, that's one of the possibilities with the collecting is that we are definitely collecting some new things but um, uh, I mentioned Rich Collins who did, did all the hydromedusae they named six new ones and, and they named them after predecessor scientists and, and people who had contributed in the past so he didn't even name one after and I'm sure he had the opportunity but he you didn't name, name one, one yeah well <laughs> I have <laughs> Okay, I have a, um, there's, there's a cuskiel that curls, and every time we see it, it's curled up. And they, the Smithsonian scientists were doing a paper on it, and they named that curl, Ionello's curl. Oh. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> kind of... <laughs> You have a question? We do. We have a question from one of our Zoom viewers. They're wondering whether the, uh, the photos you show, do they represent the natural color of the animals or do the lights you use alter their colors? I think, did everybody hear that? Is that the natural colors of the animals? I think pretty, we're shining lights on, obviously, but it's pretty much the natural colors. Um, all of these transparent things uh, look pretty blue in the water. I don't turn them. I don't color them very much, um, so, but definitely by shining our light on it, we're bringing out the colors that, that are natural, like that pink Atlanta. You see that, that's pink. So I, I don't think that the photography is altering. <laughs> Some photographers oversaturate, but uh, I try not to do that. So I think it's pretty natural. What's your favorite thing to see when you go diving? I'm sorry, what's my favorite? My favorite thing to see when I go diving. I mentioned the mollusks are my favorites. Um, I really like to see butterflies. I, I think they're, they're just fascinating. And the sea angels and those kinds of things. Those are my favorites, more so than the fish. Over here. Do we see bigger fish? <laughs> and I'm sure you're thinking of sharks. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, we, first of all, we see very, very, very few bigger fish. Um, we don't see barracuda. I mentioned we don't see big squid. Where we are, apparently, what we're seeing is the tiny stuff, which is good. We do see some jacks zipping through. Um, sharks. <laughs> For the first three or four years, we hardly ever, uh, we saw like one shark and we had no clue what it was. And we're all shooting something this big and here's this shark and how are we gonna figure out what it is? Well, Deb got a picture of the head enough that somebody said it's a silky shark. We have seen more silkies and silkies apparently are very curious. They come in very close and at first, we hardly ever saw any. Lately, we've been seeing a few more and more. I, I don't say they're aggressive in a bad way, but they're aggressively curious and they don't go away. And I've actually gotten out of the water because one of them was too close, wasn't going away, and I'm not comfortable with sharks. There's a few other people that um, work with the shark feeding boats and things like that, and they're comfortable fine, you can stay in the water. But it was near the end of the dive and I got out. So, and it seems to be silkies for some reason. They're um, further, they're not near the reef, so they're further out, out in the water column. And uh, we're running into some of those. But barracuda, um, 
No, very, very few large fish. Linda, we, good. We, they're not eating our subjects. We have a couple more questions rolling in from our Zoom audience. Uh, are any of the animals you photograph bioluminescent? I'm sorry, any? Are, are any of the animals you photograph bioluminescent? Um, I think some of them are. Uh, again, to photograph bioluminescence, you need uh, a filter on your lens and filters on your strobes and filters on your mask. And it's, it's quite an ordeal. And, and in our environment, you can't put it on and off easily. So one of the guys was trying to photograph bioluminescence and it, it was just too tedious. Um, but yes, some of them are, but we're not really capturing it. Um, he actually was taking some of the animals that we collected, photographing them at home in his environment and trying to see which ones are bioluminescent and which ones aren't. And so yes, it's there, but we're not getting it. All right, and, and another interesting one here. Over the years that you've been diving and photographing, have you seen any increases or decreases in the creatures that you're studying? Okay, have we seen increases or decreases? Speaking for black water, something is going on. I really believe that we're seeing less of the deep water larvae and some of the fish larvae because the, the ocean surface is warmer. This past summer, it was noticeably several degrees warmer than in past years. And so it seems like those things are staying deeper. Now, it's the first year. It's really hard to say you know, if this is going to be a trend. But um, a lot of those larvae, I, I would see at 40 or 50 feet, I'm not seeing. I think they're down around 100 feet. So something's going on, and we all know climate change and uh, carbon dioxide and all this stuff. So I think, and I don't, but I can't say that it's a diminishing at this point. I think it's a change in how shallow they're coming. Anybody way back there? I'm sorry, can you? I, I, I can repeat that. Can For the that? flounder images you showed, you, you mentioned how their eyes rotate, but what about their color? Have they started to establish a color pattern that's different on one side or the other, or are they kind of the same color on both sides? Did, did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. okay. No, the, um, the ones that we see in the water column are still that transparent. They haven't, they haven't solidified, and they haven't developed their, their settling colors. Um, there are definitely some of the reef fish that we see that you know I didn't show or anything where the the larvae look more like the adults. They'll be the silvery and, mm -hmm. and a little bit of color. But um, the the flounders, tongue fish, those transparent ones, we don't see them at the point where they're developing their natural their, well their adult colors. Put it that way. Somebody. Okay. I would like to know, uh, are you collecting these species and all that, that you can put it on the microscope and then determine the DNA, which you were talking about? Start that again, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I can repeat that. So are you, when you collect them, are you putting them under the microscope or are you directly collecting the DNA or do you, do you more or less hand them off to the researchers oh, that are... Oh, we hand, okay. No, we hand them off. We make sure that they're in the proper chemical and... Um, I'm lazy. Rich Collins is, um, I hand it off to him. He labels it, he tracks, he keeps all the data that we need. And then every six months or so, we hand it off to the Smithsonian or to the Florida Museum of Natural History. So we are not doing the DNA at all. No, we, can't, we don't have the uh, capability, knowledge. I mean, we're not scientists. We're, we're divers and photographers. But the Smithsonian has been excellent about running the DNA and then feeding back to us. They'll show us the image from the subject that they, they ran and tell us what the idea is. I, I see a couple more hands up. We have a few more minutes left. We could take maybe two or three more questions. <laughs> okay, <laughs> speak loud. <laughs> Do 
Okay. Okay. Bucket list subjects. Um, now, I think I mentioned that every dive is different, and we cannot predict what we're going to see. If I say I want to go and find like that cuscule larva that's all strung out and everything, I will just be frustrated. So basically, I go down and photograph whatever I find. If it's something that I've seen a lot, I'll probably ignore it. If it's something that I've seen some, but you can always get a better picture. So I will maybe take pictures, again, depending on how busy it is. If there's a lot of activity, then I will definitely bypass the more common stuff. But no, you can't go and say, I want a particular subject, and you'll just be frustrated. I was curious, <laughs> when you're diving with a group, do you use sort of like a buddy system to collect, or are you taking these snaps, these photographs, and collecting at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, am I, am I photographing and collecting at the same time? Yes, yes. And that's why I said it's so difficult, because of the big camera and everything. But we thought about having um, divers go in with us and kind of buddy up, and it, it, never really, um, it never really worked out. And then none of the photographers want to give up a night of taking pictures <laughs> to, to help someone else. So um, no, it's, it's all on your own. I hope you get a picture of hands. <laughs> <laughs> it's challenging. It's very difficult. It is. And, and that's why I, I collect maybe, at the most, three or four subjects a night. That's at the most. Okay, back in the... When, when you are collecting, do you, do you utilize a slurp gun? When you're collecting, do you utilize a slurp gun? No, now, we've been experimenting with ketchup bottles that kind of slurp. Um, no, we just, we've been using Ziploc bags. So that you, um, it's about a quart size and you just um, kind of lift it up and try to get your subject and close it real quick. Um, a slurp gun, I don't, know, I don't know the mechanics, because then you have to get it out of there into something, and we have a mesh bag that we carry that we can put the Ziplocs in. So I, I know, but the, the ketchup bottles are a little interesting because they have a, a lid, so you have to manage the cap and get it get it off and back on and yeah it's <laughs> it's challenging we all know one more i have a question about the larva laying eggs so we saw that the larva are procreating what about the adult fish do they procreate or is it just at that larva stage that are creating more eggs the larva laying eggs? I, I, the question was, we saw some photos of, of things laying eggs yeah. mixed in with things that were larval, and I think the question is, uh, are the adults laying eggs? Are the larvae laying eggs? It's, you know, there's, there's lots of different things in these pictures, and yeah. where are the eggs coming from? Yeah, the larvae the larva are not laying eggs. They are not mature enough. They haven't settled, etc. The things that were laying eggs were the ones like the sea butterflies and the sea angels that live their lives in the water column. So those are adults. They, they live in the water column the, their whole cycle. So those are the ones that are laying eggs. But no, none of the larvae themselves are laying okay, eggs. I was really confused by that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's the duration of your five miles south? How long does it take to go here? What's the duration of your, of your typical dive as you drift five miles underwater. That, that was a question that popped up online as well. Okay, the duration yeah, of the dives, the two boats. One boat, the dive is 90 minutes. Pure Vita is 90 minutes. Uh, Walker's dive charters is two hours. So that brings in a whole, you know, 90 minute dive at 45, 50 feet is definitely doable. A two hour dive, and some of the people are going deeper. So people are using, like if you're familiar with scuba diving, the typical tank is an 80, and they're using 100s up to 140s. So they're using great big tanks and nitrox enabled to stay down the two hours. My dive is usually 90 minutes. I use a steel 100, and um, I can last 90 minutes, and I usually don't go real deep. I usually start at 50 and work my way up. So, but it's, it's uh, max determined by the boats. Yep. Yeah. Are, do you ever have a problem where there's too many sticking uh, jellyfish in the water? 
the, the, the question <laughs> is, do you ever have a problem where there are too many stinging jellyfish in the water? Not really. Um, no. They, we've never hit where there's too many to be tolerable. Uh, occasionally we have the big moon jellies, um, but they're, they're big and, and they're, tr they're scattered around. Um, the amphipods bother us more than the jellyfish, actually. So, no, we don't have um, swarms, really. No. We have time for one last question. Any last questions? All right. Well, oh, I see it. <laughs> Under the. What's the concentration of these creatures? Is it like being in a blizzard? Or just a few snowflakes? So, the question is what's the concentration of these creatures? Is it like being in a blizzard or is it just a few snowflakes? Uh, definitely not a blizzard. Um, so some nights are better, definitely better than others. Um, but if I come back, if I shoot maybe 20 subjects, that's a really good night. Some nights I shoot five or six. So I may shoot on a poor night, it's 30, 30 images. On a good night, it's maybe 150. But no, um, definitely not a blizzard. You have to hunt for stuff and you, you really look. Yeah. All right, well, can everybody help me give Linda a big round of applause? Thanks. Thank you so much. That was, that was incredible. I learned a lot. I hope you guys did as well. Now, I just want to tell you, she, she mentioned sexual parasitism in the deep sea anglerfish. I don't want to give away too much, but I promise I'll talk about that on February 20th when I give a presentation about some of the more unusual reproductive strategies in the ocean. Uh, just a quick reminder that we have a, another fantastic lecture next week. Spencer Fire will be here to tell us about the impacts of harmful algal bloom toxins on marine mammals. Some of the pictures he sent me are really cool. He's holding onto things like bottlenose dolphins and sea lions. So I know you'll like that one. And then one last reminder, if you haven't already signed up for our email newsletter, please stop by the table in the back, pop your name on there. That way, once a month, we can give you an update on what our organization is up to. Thanks, everybody. See you again in a week.